Hello, this is case discussion trying to find the best solution. I'm moderator Dr. Kim Se-jin. Today, to solve your issues, we have invited clinical masters Dr. Kim kyung won Dr. Kim Young-tek, and Dr. Park Jong-hyun. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Then let's see the case of today. 2014, I met this patient for the first time. The maxillar, both side posterior, periodontally, there were problems in 2015. At another clinic on the upper right part, imp uh, had implant and came back to me in 2017. And 2021, had on the left upper side implant restoration. It looks both side on the sinus, uh, mucosa uh, detachment. Uh, it could have been maybe better. So these are my questions. First, on the right side, it's been six years, but ossification is not well done. So if I, if there was a shorter implant, maybe there would have been more bone uh, formed on the apex side. Secondly, even left side, which I did, uh, there's a bit of detachment that's falling short. But thanks to shorter implant, after time, maybe there's more probability of bones uh, formation on the apex side. Thirdly, uh, if the only apex had elevation after time, would there be more bone formation? Fourth question, with the crustal approach, uh, if sinus lifting is done, then sometimes wall detachment is not done very well, and sometimes only the apex is elevated. With crustal approach, would it be better to use shorter implant? Fifth and last question, with the 4 millimeter residual bone, the, with the lateral approach, uh, if you place a 10 millimeter implant, then is it better for a patient than uh, placing 6 millimeter uh, um, implant on a, a crustal approach? That was very uh, detailed uh, questions, and we have invited uh, the dentist who actually posed those questions here. So it's Dr. Park <laughs> jong Hyun who asked the questions. Actually, I uh, uh, tried also solve uh, my challenges while talking about other cases, but today I have my own case. So two uh, doctors. So what did you think? I think Dr. Park, uh, in terms of sinus bone grafting, he has maybe thought more than I did. Because for me, I don't really think much because I thought it was a bit routine. But with the Dr. Park posing these questions, it has also given me opportunity to think about a lot. Actually, this were also issues I was also thinking. So I was creating my own reference for this, but I've never really thought uh, thoroughly. But with this uh, case, um, I actually thought, yes, I should make my own more detailed uh, references. Uh, so I did so. So I think it's going to be a very good discussion. So viewers, if you're joining us, um, you know, think about what would you do. And if you have any good comment, please uh, post them on the uh, chat thing box. So first, Dr. Park, what were your um, uh, challenges here? Could you share with us? Yes, um, I, there's no thing I want to insist with here, but I just want to learn from you all. Now, six years ago, the city was taken at another clinic, and I do not believe ossification was done very well. So when thinking the reason for that, first, I think it's because the bone growth factor coming, uh, you know, I think maybe uh, not such detent. So uh, you see there is another palatal, not much of detachment. And uh, if you use re material that's not very resorbsible, even um, after time, histologically you see bones, but with autogenous bones, uh, mixing with the you know, graft material. I think that's the situation. So this is my case. So in the past, uh, I used synthetic bone with a lot of um, H 
uh, A. So if you look at cases, uh, then even after time, bone formation is very slow. And with the time, of course, you see a lot of uh, ossifications and, you know, autogenous bone being formed. But if it's not uh, resorbed very well, because there is a lot of volume of HA, um, you know, bone formation is usually very delayed and bone quality on the x-ray was also not very good. Here, now HA share, do you know how much it was? Now, I use OSTEM product, and for Q, OS HA was 75%, beta TCP was 25%. So it's a very uh, high um, HA ratio, yes. So if you use this type of product, bone uh, formation is further slow. And uh, if you further analyze the case, uh, this is what I uh, detected. Sinus cavity, if it's large, then it's not so uh, favorable for uh, bone formation. That's what literature said. Of course, if you have a lot of time and if you have a favorable condition, it might be not so. But anyway, if you put the shorter implant and sinus cavity only up to narrow try to form bone there then up to apex bone quality wise could have been better uh, that's uh, what I started to think now this is my case and again here also it was not really well done because on the wall side uh, you know detachment was not very well done up to the palatal uh, side so Maybe because it shorter implant was used, so bone formation is actually being, uh, you know, being prepared on the apex side. If I had to do this case again, maybe in six millimeter implant, I would have used. So long implant, you know, whether to use uh, it or not is my kind of um, issue today. Uh, because what I found uh, is up to broad cavity, you know, bone to be formed well up there, then with the crest approach, it's not easy. So like the professor here, if through the lateral approach, if I could create good environment for ossification, then long implant, you know, like 10 millimeters, putting there is okay. But with the crestal approach, then narrow sinus cavity only within that range, uh, even if the bone volume is low, bone quality, I believe recently could be better. That's what I started to believe. So with this case, after time, short implants, it, when I use them, then bone uh, ossification up to apex was quite well done. So my opinion is that for the sinus lift, the maxilla side, if you do it very well, be good. But if you up for a crystal approach, then even if it's short, ossification uh, that is uh, can be done well up to um, apex is something you should uh, consider. So. Uh, this is another uh, clinic, uh, it was done, so it was impressive, so I took CT, it was really happy result, there's no tear, and I think there was no bone graft, but with this long implant, still bone is formed so well, but you don't really see this type of cases always. So another uh, case from a, a, a literature, so if you have covered of the uh, with the mucosa, I think it's okay. But for this uh, long um, implant for functioning without ossification, what would happen? Of course, sinusitis uh, probability is low, but in functioning, this long implant, you know, what does it serve? Is some is a question that I always have. So this is animal study, but like this, if you have perforation and place implant rather than soft tissue you first have germs uh, you know being attached then without um, removing implants implant uh, there's a lot of uh, chance uh, this developing into sinus ascites so this is another uh, case now using guide placed implant and for one year um, H a uh, volume was high was the material that I used and on the palatal side, um, you know, the 
part uh, that could have more bone uh, growth factor became low and because HA volume is uh, high uh, bonification you know was rather slow of course with time there will be form uh, formed but if I you know had used here 8.5 but if I had no bone grafting with 7 millimeter uh, implant maybe in terms of bone quality it would have been better uh, if 8.5 rather than 7 millimeters uh, placing it here has it really been helpful is what I want to ask of your opinion if I had used your seven millimeters implant and did no bone grafting is it eight you know 8.5 then 8.5 or 7 I think it will be similar result with seven millimeters uh, you don't have to do sinus elevation yes just a very a small I think up to eight plus uh, there will be more ossification because bone here their functions I don't think is very helpful I think uh, it's actually helpful because uh, maybe we should look talk about the uh, graft material first. In the sinus, any material is okay. Uh, HA volume being high and that remaining there for a long time could be an issue is what you say. But, you know, the synthesis bone is not very good for bone formation or bone is retained very well, but general graft, you know, go bone formation is done uh, well. But I think in my experience and looking at various references within sinus, uh, it's really favorable for bone formation because the bone can really come up from the uh, bottom part. And I didn't bring that literature today. But Schneiderian membrane, they say, uh, osteogenic, uh, they say, has a potential. And that was uh, from uh, Yonsei University uh, paper. In Schneider membrane, bone is formed. Of course, not all uh, parts, uh, but uh, but it the bone can come from all sides. And so, autogenic bone, uh, if not that is used, if the bone can be made, anything can uh, kind of goes. And here, it's really good. Uh, well made. So with seven millimeters, without bone grafting, then oh, you cannot have bone on the apical side. And if you anchor in the bipodical side, I think that is itself is good result. You know, in sinus uh, being elevated by one to two millimeters, as you have uh, shown, it's uh, it can be covered everything. So I think uh, you know the sinus uh, being elevated, it doesn't uh, create a problems. So aesthetically and also the various uh, considering force that uh, being uh, on the implant, uh, covering apex about that bone grafting with a 8.5. I think that was the best option available. I think it's really well done a case. It's something you can be proud of. Uh, maybe that's what I think. So with seven millimeters going short, inevitably if in the sinus side, uh, there is no consistency, then it's really hard to for elevation in the extraction socket, the healing is not uh, complete, then in a challenge situation, 7 millimeter could be an alternative, but basically 8.5 is something that uh, you should do go with. Uh, that's my opinion. So you did really well. So I do agree with Dr. Kim. Still, uh, you know, in the past, uh, the, if you look at my uh, implant cases on the upper uh, posterior, I even did 13 millimeters. Of course, I don't do that. Uh, nowadays, I usually go for 10 millimeters. Of course, sometimes I go uh, if there's a reason 8.5. But in not really up to seven unless there is a specific reason. And you said that the bone formation is in delayed because the HA volume is high. That's a characteristics of that material. So with that photo, I do believe um, it's kind of good result and well done. And personally, synthetic bone in late 80s, uh, there has been, you know, for me, bad memories about HA. So I don't really go for aesthetic bone still. But with those photos, I don't think there is a lot of issues. Well, thank you. So one of my problem has now been solved. So my opinion is this. Now, this uh, sinus lift done well and wall side is okay. Then, you know, you do lung implant is okay but if you do hydraulic lifting 
uh, and crystal approach, sometimes it doesn't go well as you intended. Then with shorter implant, if, and if there's a perforation on the apex side, there's a soft tissue, and there is less a chance of this uh, creating uh, problems. And if you look at cases like this, with the osteotome and then with the apex only type was used and st uh, always for this uh, approach. Uh, new radio opaque line is created and the cortical line is um, absorbed and disappears. That's what uh, is shown. So if the sinus floor uh, covered uh, in this uh, fixture, then with the osteotome, uh, you only do sinus lift with that, then uh, I think it's most cases we, yeah, they had used a short implant. Of course, um, this is my very personal opinion. Anyway, after 45 months, uh, prosthesis is maintained very well. And if you look at this uh, root um, x-ray, the existing cortical line has disappeared and new radio opaque line has been formed. And to me, I see that a lot with the short implant. What do you think? This is it seven millimeters? Yes. Actually, if you were going to use osteotome, then 8.5 would have been okay. I mean, 10 would be too much. I think that would not be a good option. But 7 to 8.5, it's all okay. And the, you said there's a line on the apex side. Then actually bone about uh, 0 0.25 grams of filled uh, in terms of forming good lines later on would have been good. Also, of course, on short term, this or that would have good uh, same result, but HA uh, being there uh, for a long time could be an issue. But if you're on a long term basis, like 45 months, then on the sinus, that bone uh, graft material being there, maintaining volume and, you know, uh, creating good uh, uh, bone uh, forms and distributing the uh, force, I think would have been okay. Uh, so this time type of results uh, I think is okay. Actually for me, uh, short I don't believe really use short implant because yes, it's very easy for surgery, but I'm uh, afraid of being criticized by prostodontist because I don't do prostodontic treatment. So still using short implant, you know, of course, I'm going to talk about literature a bit later on, but on the lower posterior side, short implant, the bone housing called is different. So still they say it's okay, but on the upper side, a short implant there is a chance um, you know and even literature says there could be prostatic uh, complications so honestly one of the reasons I don't use go with the short implant is uh, because uh, I feel sorry for prosthodontists so like dr. Kim said if I'm going to go with it anyways you know and dr. Park you know crystal approach you know it's a blind area so we don't really know during surgery what would happen so being too negative and trying to uh, be too cautious might not be uh, the way. Uh, you know, if you do pumping incisions uh, well, then um, I think its elevation can be done quite well. So it's a bit different with the osteotome we had used in the past. Actually, when you place 10 millimeters, uh, to do prosthesis, it's the same. So prosthodontists, uh, they say 10 millimeter, they might welcome it, but 10 millimeter, uh, you know, advantage, it's about one to two, it might be 1.8 to two, um, and it becomes longer, it's more favorable favorable you know because the ratio is better so that's their that advantage but here what is more important is the imp not implant to crown ratio but crown height space uh, the crown house space uh, being an issue if it's more than a few millimeters I don't remember numbers but there's a literature so it is something uh, you can recover with so I think um, so implant is therefore allowed and it's just the single might be a problem, but you had a splinted implant, then you have uh, two or more uh, times of advantage structurally. So in that regard, um, you know, uh, it, might, it could be better. So I feel like I should um, think new about this. So like A, 
uh, you have a lot of that you know the what bo becomes bone it's not material but what what uh, where the bone growth of factors can com come uh, needs to be uh, secured so that you know blood comes uh, comes and bone is formed so like B, if there's less detachment and trying to put a long implant, then on the apex side, uh, if HA volume is high uh, in your material, then ossification uh, is not really that done well. But like C, if you place like the short implant uh, sufficiently deep and then uh, use material that is very well resorbed, then always uh, you have acceptable results. And that's why I lean more toward C. So now looking back, I feel now this was uh, QS, uh, plus was used. So beta, uh, TCP uh, uh, volume is high here, so it's a bit more resorbable. So I uh, uh, secured a lot of space and still, you know, bone has been formed very well. This is because uh, the resorbable material was used and the uh, wall formation was done also good. But if you look at number 16, the arrowed area, look at there, um, apex, side maybe compared to using short implant what is advantage is uh, something i try to ask so if i uh, do it again i would have uh, used seven millimeters then on the x-ray my opinion it looks more comfortable you know it looks bone formation done up to the apex very well so what i'm um, still uh, struggling with is the what there's not good ossification rather than them short implant that gets good ossification up to apex would be better that was my starting point uh, the one the why i use short simple a uh, short implant mo uh, more it's a simple reason because i'm not very good with the retro approach so i want to do crestal approach and that's why i opt for more a uh, short implant so why i have to use long implant uh, what is the base for uh, long implant uh, usage? Uh, I'm curious. Uh, so if you could some you could give us uh, give me feedback on that, it would be really good. So this is done uh, in other clinic, and there was screw loosening, and I thought this was interesting. So if you see it, the materials was uh, filled in unnecessary part, and with time, would it really be helpful? And something um, I thought about. And another thing I always think about is uh, because I favor crestal approach, then convex. if you have convex area, then there's actually more bones. I want to go there. But that is more challenging. So if you want to do lifting there, there's a lot of tension and you end up uh, having more perforation. So in this case also, if there is always convex area, I want to place implant, but if you do a uh, crystal approach there, uh, maybe uh, something different might be better. One well, meaning the convex is more bone, but there is more tension. So after five years, uh, if you see the bone has been formed, uh, yes, there. So another thing, perforation is issue. Long uh, implant doing crystal approach, uh, you probability wise, uh, there's a, a more probability for rupture because you want to, uh, you know, do elevation more. So on the other case, looking at it, you see there's a, a loosening, so there's a perforation. So you detect there's a perforation, and, you know, your gut tells you perforation, so I finish with short implant. So after placing short implant, even there's a perforation, it soft tissue covers and you know bone formation, uh, I do believe becomes more likely. Wait, then here, perforated, perforation was checked with x-ray and you switched to a short implant? I, uh, even without perforation, I would have still gone with the short implant, but April and August, 
Of course, maybe enlargement size is different, but compared to what was there in April, it seems you went uh, in August with shorter one. Well, some I, I don't um, remember. Uh, maybe I saw the perforation and maybe switch to a uh, short one because the buckle bone, so there's more diameter and short uh, in terms of length. Well, just leaving it there, although you switch to short one, but if you just left it there, then the perforated part uh, physiologically within sinus, uh, it would have uh, naturally cleared. The rather than bone uh, material, uh, you know, melts, uh, it absorbed, it would have been uh, uh, drained from there. So that's, you know, that's how you get to the apex. Then the lengthwise, it would have been more favorable. Actually, I'm still scared when it comes to uh, sinus uh, part. Well, this might be a good approach. As you said, for me, I would have just uh, leave it be when there was perforation. But maybe I tried to uh, give medication to prevent inflammation. That would have been what I've done. But switch to shoulder implant, r reducing the load, then that is more uh, alignment to the goal of using seven millimeters because short implant uh, was uh, created to solve long implant uh, problems. So using seven millimeter as a rescue of 8.5 was also a good approach. I think you switched implant. I don't really remember. Let me know later on. So final prosthesis was delivered, and looking at these cases, you know, all I tried to uh, solve with socket lift, so within narrow cavity, I tried to solve it. So I didn't go with the 7 millimeter bone quality was really bad. So even if uh, within sinus cavity, up to uh, 12 millimeters, I tried to lift uh, if, it, you know, there's no specific reason to do bone grafting. So. The radio opaque line has moved more toward upper part, and there within narrow with the uh, you know ossification becomes quicker. So, other um, question has already been um, answered. So, sinus lift with the crest approach, then it's really hard to be always consistent. So, six to seven millimeter implant is what I prefer. So, on that part. Maybe I would like to get your um, response, Dr. Kim kyung -won. As for me, actually, I use long ones, and because I'm teaching, you know, the problem cases is what I mostly deal with. So I actually brought a fractured case. This is a first. Uh, Patient came in 2012, uh, teeth, tooth was extracted, and 2018 implant was placed. And my search shows, I think it was uh, beginning of AO, so casket was used with the crystal approach and um, the SS2, 5.11 uh, by 11.5 uh, was a place, uh, which is one I don't use um, much anymore. And after about almost five years uh, later, I implant uh, fractured. Actually, it's a male uh, patient with a strong bite force. So uh, it uh, broke after five years. And because SS type uh, bottom part uh, fracture, so I could not use ERP uh, kit. So using trapping burr, I uh, took it out. And as you can see, in the last x-ray, after removing the implant on the uh, top part, the AOS bone uh, that I uh, grafted with cast uh, kit is uh, maintained. So after uh, removing implant with the trap fiber, if it's now allergen or other bone grafting was done, but um, this was a local area and due to cost issues, uh, the patient did not want a bone grafting. So after removing it um, about three months later, this is when I uh, replaced it. So I didn't do bone grafting, but there was not much of an issue. So after four years, 10 months, a broken implant was removed and then 
implant 5.0 by 10 millimeters was delivered, but uh, bone graft had uh, been done already. So without any uh, bone grafting, uh, implant was placed, and after about three years, it's uh, maintained. So the initial using casket with the crystal approach that uh, been about eight years ago but the bone materials is graft material is still functioning and for me in ossification there was not much of a problem so for me um, i prefer long uh, implants as i said so i think it's a similar case to mr uh, dr park so i brought this so this patient uh, you know, uh, it was done in clinic, not by me, but uh, 27 uh, was missing. So on the CT, residual bone height is about f about 4 millimeters. Uh, and the clinic uh, doctor, through crystal approach, placed this type 10 millimeter implant and had used osteotome. And because of that, as you can see in the post op uh, CT, as Dr. Park says, sinus membrane has not been um, elevated. So here uh, it's leaning more palatal side, so it was okay. But on the buccal side, the membrane has not been um, elevated. And, you know, graft material is just sitting on top of apex. So with the follow-ups, as you can see now, about, uh, you know, two uh, years, uh, six months later, number eight was extracted and, uh, you know, twen number 27 implant uh, became loose. So that was also removed. And after removal and after implant failure uh, with me, uh, we took CT, but nothing of the graft um, rem uh, remained and the bone quality was also not so good so again uh, came to me for surgery so for me like this for single on the upper part i don't prefer doing crystal approach so in number 27 i had to place implant and there is a host uh, bone that's sufficient no problem but i have to do grafting i think lateral approach would be better so for tw number 27 uh, depending on the patient because it's on the uh, you know inside so approach might be tricky so i did bone grafting and with the fibrin blue i did repair because there was a tear and through sinus graft bone graft uh, thing was done done and 10 millimeter implant was uh, placed and about six years later that's the last photo grafted bone is maintained and actually there is no problem everything is functioning very well so as for me now as a surgeon if I to open it then doing for sure bone grafting uh, is better to uh, respond uh, if there's any complication later on some you know dentists uh, say without you can do within sinus without bone grafting so of course it's case by case um, and if there is a no distal free hand uh, there are um, teeth around it that it's okay but if you are doing approach uh, then I always go with the bone grafting so that was the case and for this uh, case actually in the past uh, with allogenic bone I did the cluster approach so in 2011 with the casket implant was placed and about six seven years later on this is what happened sinus floor from its initial position as you can see uh, the bone material was put in there uh, sufficiently, but with time, implant uh, came down to the apex side. Because allergen was used, there was more resorption, but uh, implant top area, in the apex area, especially for allergen bone uh, graft, uh, then uh, bo uh, implant comes to the apex side at least. So especially with the crystal approach then, as Dr. Park said, has said, uh, new cortical bone will be formed. But here, it's a heterogenic or genograft was done, and you know, 26 and 27 was missing. And there, uh, with the casket, three implants were delivered with a crystal approach. I think it was 10 millimeter implants. So we did bone grafting, and here, as I said before, we use I use bovine bone, and about four uh, years later, also. Of, 
uh, bovine bone was used, but still now on the top part, bovine bone has disappeared and has come down to the apex side. So for me, crestal approach, then compared to lateral approach, you know, with the lateral approach, if you create dome shape, it's retained. But with the crestal approach, from the you feel it from the bottom, so you cannot stack up. Hence, for most implants up to apex side, the bone comes down. Therefore, a, a bit, uh, uh, you know, a top part than apex. And using longer implant in terms of bone formation, it's more favorable. Uh, basically, that's my opinion. So I looked up, and Dr. Park uh, talked about short implants. So I looked up, and so Hu Wang did 2019 this uh, literature, and it's a systemic review. Looked at 18 uh, studies and looked at uh, about 1,600 uh, implants, and looked at um, 793 extra short, uh, less than seven six millimeters, and 820 long implant, and survival rate for one to three years there was no statistical uh, significant difference. So both were okay. And when it comes to extra short implant, marginal bone loss was less and biological complication was less. And in terms of surgical time and treatment cost-wise also uh, was less. However, prosthetic uh, complications, uh, when it comes to that, uh, the long implants uh, reported less, significantly uh, less, and it was the report, and the conclusion was as for 6 millimeter or less extra short implants uh, for three-year follow-up uh, on the atherobic posterior uh, side, it could be an option, but for long-term effectiveness of extra short dental implant uh, that requires further study. That's the conclusion. So I find that maybe short implants uh, would not be, uh, you know, good with the prosthetic treatment. And there's another uh, systemic review uh, literature. So it started with 1954 references and a lot of were filtered out in between, but for short implants less than six minutes, Millimeter survival rate wise compared to longer implants, uh, there's no problem in the short term. But in terms of long term follow up, actually it was done in China. So there was no clear definition for long term follow up in this literature. But compared to short implants, survival rate is uh, poor. Of course, this is a systematic review. But in terms of marginal bone loss, short implant or long implant, there was not much of a difference. And the conclusion of this paper is that uh, short implant itself, as Dr. Kim has said, clown to implant ratio, the in terms of CI ratio, it's higher. Hence, uh, in terms of marginal bone loss, that could be issue, but it the reality is there's no effect coming from there, but when it comes to short implant compared to long-term, long implant, on a long-term, uh, the survival rate is short. So if it's a single implant especially, then on the posterior area, there could be more um, problems. But of course, uh, long-term uh, follow-up uh, is needed again. So as a surgeon, uh, looking at those uh, systemic review, me first opting for a short implant, uh, I become hesitant. Thank you for that. Now, lastly, Dr. Kim Young-Tech. Well, before that, to Dr. Kim, I have a question. Then recently, what kind of surgery do you uh, surgical procedure do you do? Uh, for me, I mean, it depends uh, on cases, but crystal approach uh, for distal freehand, if it uh, patients are young, you know, young is ambiguous term now, but early uh, 60s could be considered nowadays young. So if it's distal freehand, so there's no um, these at the back and it is four millimeter remaining, then I opt for lateral approach to bone grafting and place implant. Uh, then uh, even if later on there's a complication, it's easier for repair, like uh, delivering implant again. And if it's uh, crest approach and four millimeters, then number five, number six, if there is a teeth at the back, then as Dr. Park has said, more narrow, Sinus within uh, in the sinus cavity, if there's a teeth uh, front and back, crystal approach would also be okay. 
Then um, again, I also have a question. Now, um, implant failed uh, or became loose on the maxillary side. Then do you remove all the uh, bone uh, graft materials? I don't uh, remove them. Of course, if it's an early failure, then you know implant had inflammation uh, and bone materials was also there's inflammation and uh, there was a failure. Then I remove all the materials, but implant that was being used and there was a uh, and there was a loading. Then uh, I just uh, re don't remove the materials. I think you have to look at the cause. If the osseo integration failed, resulting in implant failure, then if you look at the implant itself, the you know, osseo integration in the implant happens on few parts, not all. And there will be areas that attach the sinus or not. Then that sometimes results into failure. So if you remove the failure inside, it's not because of the inflammation, but because of low in osseo integration, it cannot withstand the occlusion force. So the bone to implant contact, I mean. So contact itself cannot re uh, withstand uh, the load. So if you remove it and you know look inside, then the grafted uh, bone uh, sometimes is very hard. So if there's a fibers, then you remove them, and you just wait a bit and then place the implant, then it's like uh, placing where there is bone. So no uh, issues uh, if there's a fla uh, failure. Of course, if the inflammation you have to remove, but in other cases, I don't remove. Then um, when it comes to crystal approach and lateral approach, I actually also thought about it, which is better, uh, is what I thought. So I started with the lateral approach first. So I'm so familiar with the lateral approach. You, if you open with the lateral approach, then Schneider membrane, removing that, and you know, putting bone material, graft material in there, in there is more convenient. But when it comes to crest approach, I use ostem, tom, so I don't use the casket or hydraulic um, elevation. But it's really challenging. Crest takes less time, but I have to really focus because you should not have a tear. And also in drilling, I, even if I know there would be tear, I try to stay within the line. And when you put the bone uh, with the ostem, I really uh, careful, but with the lateral, you can just open. Uh, so I do understand surgeons preferring lateral approach but complication wise crystal is much better you know they give a more advantage uh, patient mobility um, crystal approach has you know very low side eff effects if crystal approach is done very well they say it's very comfortable and lateral approach they find it really stressful so but not always patients don't complain like that but maybe uh, my patients anyways so going with the crystal in the future, I think it's going to be the trend. But those that are doing retro approach uh, well, crystal approach, you have to be cautious. Uh, but uh, there are also advantage. You can just open it. So I always tell students do lateral approach uh, well, and then familiar yourself with the crystal approach. If you are good with the crystal approach, it becomes easier. And with the perforation, if there's issues, then there are other options you can solve easily, like with lateral other things. So I think that is the best approach. So you practice lateral approach and be familiar with that too. So. I actually have an, one more question. Then, lateral approach to lift, you know, elevate membrane is better, but the bone growth factor, you lose one, one wall for that factor. So, ossification, 
Of course, with the CT, you have to uh, make a judgment. But if you look at the CT, the, if you look at the quality, then I believe crystal approach is favorable in terms of ossification. It might look that way. Maybe yes, because I go with the short implant. But if you open with the lateral approach, if I may answer that question, if you open with the lateral, then you put you put in hole. In the past, you really created a window, a uh, really big window like Cardwell. But nowadays, with the Treffin, you know, it's less than one uh, uh, in terms of a diameter. So you open window, put the bone, and close the window, and use the uh, tip, or you cover it with the membrane. So probably the problem was also something past doctors struggled with. So putting covering with soft tissue after bone grafting or adding membrane in there, success rate becomes different. This is because where you get the go bone potential, whether you can get it from the wall or not. Uh, you know, that it, sh it showed uh, as a result in various literature. So if, if you have done retro, uh, if you don't open it too much and, you know, so add membrane there, um, ossification can be done. So Dr. Tan also talked about that too. But recently, I think lateral approach, and then I don't really cover it membrane anymore. Because without membrane, of course, there could be some sacrifice in terms of bone, but in terms of implant or survival rate, in terms of all bone, there could be slight difference. But clinically, I do not believe it's a, a much of a difference. So uh, for me, actually, forming that because of the uh, lateral window formation, bone suffering, I don't think so. And on the lateral side, uh, from palatal side, or, uh, there's a, another side, there's a lot of blood supply. So I don't think you have to be too concerned. Personally, you know, two or three implants need to be placed. Or th then from the classical cascade, you need hydro elevation. That takes a lot of time. And sometimes uh, it's a blind spot area. So I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, I don't have visibility in surgery. But on the lateral approach, there is a visibility. So that's better. So I do agree with Dr. Kim. If those that can do lateral approach, then crestal approach uh, is not burdensome. But if you cannot do lateral approach, then while uh, you know handling issues that you can come up on the crestal approach, it might be tricky handling those issues. Due to time, whether I can uh, do my presentation, well, but let me, let me get started. In terms of short implant, Actually, in all my surgeries, I always need a reference because I'm uh, teaching at a university. So if I may share my reference, short implant when in sinus, is it uh, safe? I also looked up um, literature. And as Dr. Kim said, conclusion why survival rate, be it short or long implant, there's not much of a difference. So, of course, when it comes to complications, short implants, they say, has less complication. And complication here, they mean biological complications. So marginal bone loss or peri-implantitis compared to long implant, uh, they have uh, less because long surgery and because of the more bone grafting, that's the result. So short implant, uh, they say, is more favorable. Now, this one, this reads, uh, so meta analysis systematic re review by Dr. Kim, and that this one is included in the system by re re uh, review. So they see RCT of comparing 6 to 11 millimeters. So, so they set the patient, placed at the multi centers, and looked at the results. So uh, one year follow is short, but it uh, gives credible result. What it says is that they analyze by cost and the discomfort of patient and so surgery time. And in terms of survival rate and complication, there's uh, not much of a difference. But patient discomfort, there is a difference. And surgery time took longer, and it was more expensive. Unilateral approach, of course, is more expensive. So they said short might be better. And that was reflected in that uh, Dr. Kim's um, uh, systematic review uh, paper. So 
short implant less than 8 millimeters being more stable, once you have that conclusion, then there will be a generation where you don't really need to use long one anymore because there are scientific proofs. So now I also go with about 8 millimeters implant. And on another systematic review, short implant and long implant was again compared. And the reason I opted for this literature is that the implant survival, marginal bone loss, and uh, complication and prosthesis failures, or statistically, there's no significant difference. But the systematic review meta-analysis literatures, if you see them, you always have this type of graphs uh, like this. And if you look at that, there is a line and on one side favor sort implant, the other side they say favor standard implant. And if you look at this graph, you see the tendency. Now all three, uh, there's not significant difference, but they are more leaning towards standard implant, right? So standard implant actually overall shows favorable results, but statistically not significant difference. So statisticians would say there's no difference, but for clinicians like us, you see this tendency, and we also feel it in our clinics. So complication-wise, actually, same as other literatures, com there's less complication, biological complications for so um, and prosthetic uh, failures uh, against uh, similar result uh, in terms of biological complication. Short has a favorable result. So short implant, when it comes to biological complication, they have less. And biological complication is the biggest reason for uh, peri-implantitis and for removing implant. So it seems sort uh, as a favorable result, more favorable result. But uh, as Dr. Park, I think what he said is, you know, is shorter implant possible? What do you think about short implant? He asked. And if you look at survival rate, first you have eight millimeter implant was regarded as short and uh, compared to that longer than eight millimeters. And it shows survival rate. Now it's not much of a difference. If you see the graph, short is actually tendency wise a bit better. But when it comes to standard versus eight millimeter or less, so seven or six millimeters, then standard actually becomes much better. So if you consider extra short, so you have short implant, survival rate is okay, standard, and then extremely short or extra short, uh, that would be the uh, survival rate based on the scientific um, evidence. So. Uh, what is the load distribution is something we also need to think about. We mostly use as internal type. And load in the prosthesis, internal is disadvantages. TS is um, disadvantages and SS. And the load is in the abutment and where it comes touch with the implant. Even there is a fixture, there is a load there. And when it the load that is as, uh, on the implant fixture, if it's vertical load, then it's overall distributed. But if it's oblique load, then it's focused on the apex side. So on the side rather than the bottom of the apex. So you have to remember that. So in the sinus lifting, if you have no, less bone in bo apex, you don't have to worry about that because uh, bone is sufficiently around um, implant, even if the apex is not filled, it's okay. Although it was mentioned briefly, without bone grafting on the sinus and implant acting as tenting and putting the sin uh, uh, shared either membrane, of course, it was animal study. But histology shows that on the apex side, there is a kind of, sh under the uh, Schneider membrane, there is a kind of a line. So I think that it's also helpful results. So, and there's a load rather than apex, it's the apex side that's uh, impacted. So considering that, you know, elevation like that would be okay, is what I think. But if you look at another uh, fine element analysis, uh, longer or standard implants uh, produce lower stress. So standard is favorable than um, 
interflow distribution. Uh, so this type of literature uh, is already available. So just opting for short implant is not easy given such an evidence. So this literature is really important because it shows histology and uh, it also carry, has a lot of things we already discussed. So this is from Yonsei University, from Dr. Lee jong Sok, and look at the actual uh, first human histology. So there was a donation and we were able to see histology. So it's a really precious um, uh, data. So it's from 2017 and um, if you look at it, BCP uh, material was uh, used, and one is a uh, general implant, and another one is taper defects eye or S company's implant. And as you can see on the left side, it was a bit higher. No, sorry, this is right side. It's a bit more higher, and this is a bit lower. And later on, after six years, to the apex, uh, it becomes lower. Now, as you said, there is healing, and we can now look at the uh, tissues. So we took the micro CT, and you can see inside of the sinus, and you see uh, bones that have not been ossified. So PCP material, uh, and I think bone is four to six, and so beta PCP is a bit higher, but the graft material you see like as a dot around implant, same here. So let's look at the histology. So bone elevated and because of the particles, uh, even if you're concerned, you see new bones have been formed. So you don't have really have to worry about this. Of course, it took six years, but what in the residual bone, it can sustain that time. And uh, if there's no loading failure, then bone that is there can last. And with time, it will be resorbed. So that's OK. And here, if it's a bit loose, then uh, including a in elevation, including apex might be better. So there is a bit thin area, but no problem in function. So in terms of load distribution, uh, it will uh, touch the apex side. So I think um, it would um, be OK. So for me, short implants, I do believe you can use that. Short implant compared to long implants, I think it's OK. But two short ones, uh, there's not much of a proof yet. So I, as I said, Eight millimeter implant, I would uh, opt for that at least. And when you do crustal approach, uh, as was mentioned, this side, if you can expand and you know filling that with sufficient bone, I do believe is also important. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kim Kyung Won. Dr. Um, Kim Young Tang said a lot of good things, and I hope Dr. Park, it's been helpful to you. Now, I was thinking of going uh, even for six or uh, seven, uh, six uh, millimeters, but maybe not anymore. So maybe do better sinus lifting. So anyways, I don't know whether I will really use 8.5 rather than seven millimeters from now on. Well. I am persuaded quite a bit, but anyways, I will think more about this and try to give some change in my clinical setting also. And Dr. Kim Kyung Won and what Dr. Kim Young Tae has said, uh, most things I am in agreement and short implants in terms of survival rate, if there is a difference, then of course, in the future, I will also try to be more conservative. Yes, thank you very much for today's discussion. Now, today we looked at, you know, short implant or long um, implants. So if you, I hope the discussion has been helpful to you all. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Park Jong-un for that uh, good uh, case. So with that, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much. See you next time. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. 수고하셨습니다. 수고하셨습니다.